he had a brief moment of glory with a, over a thousand wheel horsepower with a stock uh, long lock. It's a JDM Aristo long lock that has been fitted with, you know, enough airflow to make a lot of power. And shortly thereafter, it kicked the rod out. So it's got a broken stock rod, so the block, the block is garbage. We hope the head is okay. We're gonna go ahead and take it apart today with him and kind of discuss the life and death of the engine. What on this uh, 7685 Gen 1. Um, so, it, it made in 2015, we were pushing over 900. It lasted, I, it's, I mean, I, I don't beat on it hard, but it's like a weekend car, you know, type of thing. Yeah. So, back in 2017, I went back for a little more, uh, upgraded injectors, and we went to the 7685 and we dyno 1019. So it lasted like that for two years, you know, for a decent amount. But Lance said it was it was happy, you know, it wasn't it wasn't crazy. So this time around, I went I went back to kind of for the record. Right. So that's when we made the 1106. We made three pulls. Did it break on a gear change? Or did it no, it made at the down? high of fourth gear, all the way on top. Like I stayed at fourth gear, kind of crossing the the line. Okay, so it broke when you let off the gas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You look at it from a crank angle standpoint compared to a nitrous engine, okay. um, the stress is spread out over more crank angle. So you'll generally get away with much more power and torque with a turbo because it's a it's more of a gentle push on yeah. the rotator yeah. versus nitrous is just kind of an explosion. Well, it is an explosion. So I think nitrous is like a seven degrees of crank angle. Okay. And um, the pressure burst with the turbocharger is like 17 degrees. So there's a lot more time yeah. um, to distribute the stress. Yeah. It's wild to think that something like that Y2K turbo, how it stacks up to today. Yeah. No. I mean, a 7675 is, yeah. is an incredible piece of hardware compared to the old stuff. Yeah. The old stuff, it's like, you're lucky to make 700 on some of that old stuff. Yep. And that's post um, on-center housings. The on-center housings were the worst. Just can't, you can't get the air out of them. Yeah. Uh, just different times, man. Probably yeah. like almost 20 years now. Yeah, it's just evolution. You guys don't, you never run into these anymore, huh? HKS? No, there's a good amount of power to be had in the modern profiles. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was hesitant at first because I had uh, that old HKS cams. And then once we swapped, um, it was around the time that GSC was starting to come off. And you know, there was, there was 35 or 40 horsepower to be had changing cams. So it's, yeah, it's easy horsepower. Probably gonna be looking into upgrading now. Yeah, I'm looking at the the loads though. Okay. And um, so far they look really nice. You know, at you least can see the, the cams, um, they have a decent amount of mileage already. They've been right, here for but years. It's, um, it's a chilled cast cam. Yeah. And if the person installed them, okay. did the last right, you can see, like, if you look close at this lobe, see how this side is shinier than this slide? Yeah. Well, that's there's a certain amount of offset to keep the lifter spinning. Okay. You know, um, so it's not wearing in one spot. There's actually a fair share of technology that goes into flat topic cams to make them live. But these, these so far look really nice. The material is soft enough that it just kind of wipes the lobe. Okay. It doesn't, just kind of it doesn't get to the point where it creates a lot of destruction. It will sacrifice itself before the bucket. So, gotcha. so when you have a, a steel cam, the steel's hard enough that it will kill the bucket in the process. So these are 272s? Yeah, HKS 272s, and this is the first thing when it did on this motor. It went from, you know, plain old Aristo, uh, took it apart, put a fresh head gasket in there, new seals and the set of cams and dropped it in and it made 835 on the old uh, 74 millimeter that I had precision to. Yep. This was back right like 2009, 2010, right? We're trying to get the car ready for yeah, Texas. Yeah, that's so when you've Texas. had a lot of fun with this engine. Yeah. That's great.
It's pretty uniform wear. Like nothing to be uh, nothing to be worried about there on that one. Because it it um, it doesn't smear. Uh, the steel will smear into a cutter, and these things will just wear. So there's a couple little marks. Mm -hmm. See this? Yeah. And it's pretty uniform on all the lobes, but you can't, yeah, you can't get a nail in it or anything. It's just wear. Yeah. So that's nice. So when you look down the cylinder head, this is the cylinder that the rod broke in. So there's carbon where the piston doesn't touch the head, so carbon accumulates. Well, right here, when you look at it, there's this rough area that's clean. And this is from the piston hitting the head because when the rod broke, there's nothing to stop the piston from going up. So these valves are bent and you can see on the face of the valve where it's hit the piston. And you can see on the face of these valves where they've hit the piston. And it's because the piston was now turned so the valve reliefs were not lined up. And because the piston isn't going up and down in the bore anymore because the rod's broken, the valves just keep smashing into the piston. So it's not as damaging had the rod stayed con in contact. And let's say that you, um, you break a valve and the piston is still traveling up and down the bore at its regular rate of speed with all the force associated with the rotating assembly, then you can just really mangle some stuff. But the piston will just hit the head in one blow and then it no longer moves because it's not connected to the rod. But through that one blow, the amount of energy of the piston coming up the bore, it can just punch the deck of the head enough that it can change the shape of the seats because it changes the shape of the cylinder head. So you'll have cylinder heads that have been hit so hard by the piston that the cylinder head may look like it's just cosmetic damage, but it is in fact ruined and it cannot be fixed again. Or you'll have cylinder heads that the damage is just cosmetic and you'll know that when you go to surface the head and you go to cut the seats because the cutters involved will kind of show you the truth once the cosmetic stuff is removed away. So you don't know if the head is junk or not until you take it to the machine shop and have them start working on it. So you can't make the assumption, but you would be doing yourself a terrible disservice if you just put valves in this head and put it back on the engine because you don't know how far the trauma went. Trauma in an engine doesn't always have um, a aha, smoking gun, there's your problem situation. You could have trauma in an engine that it affects many pieces and without going through it and investigating each piece as an individual component, then you can't really measure the trauma that's happened. And when you have an engine like this that's effectively blown up, I mean, there's a window in the block on both sides. You know, the, the, the crank may look fine on that journal, but be bent. You know, it's, it, um, there are racers that they have a budget and they have a goal set. And if their budget is high enough and their goal set is important enough, they'll never reuse a crankshaft that saw a broken rod because the trauma is not forgotten. Just because the crank didn't break that day doesn't mean it lives the same life for the rest of its days because something really bad happened to it. Right now, this doesn't want to come off. Yeah. Well, it doesn't want to come off because there's metal that stood up around the crank. You know, like uh, Pedro's slid right off. If the engine has a quality damper on it okay. and the engine hasn't been detonated a lot, it'll generally slide right off. But this one's sticky. This damage will be present on the crank also. But if you look at the face of that pulley, compared to the face of a new one, you see all these marks, all this vibration. There's something special happened here, but there's a lot of marks. It looks like just dents and dings. It's from the parts chattering against each other. If you look at the vibration on the snout of the crank where the um, damper was, if you drag your fingernail across this area, it's rough because that thing's been shaken. What's the noises? All right. Stuff. Very 
Well, this, he had asked me to get this new for some reason. I don't know why. I was yeah, this, this is the bottom of the piston. So there's the pin bore. There's some connecting rod. So you have piston, 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 circle clip, piston, some of the skirt. More skirt. Yeah, just a bunch of piston hanging out. There's some blunt force trauma to the windage tray. <laughs> Did this keyway get beat open? Oh yeah, this crank's, well, you wouldn't, we're not gonna reuse this crank anyway because it's seen this. But this keyway, mm -hmm. this, this is why um, this, that pulley coming off hard and these marks on the crank uh -huh. are tied to the keyway zag. Okay. See how this is floppy? Yeah. You can't use a crank like this because now the damper, not only is the damper not in the right location to check the ignition timing? Yeah. Because now you're checking the ignition timing and the damper has shifted, but the damper will chatter back and forth I'll because it doesn't that. have the keyway. So this, this crank was garbage the minute this happened to it. Now, if this were an expensive engine, like yeah. a Ferrari, like a 60s Ferrari where you just can't find another crank, you'd make a repair. But because it's a commonly available crank, you throw it in the garbage, but you, this is unacceptable. Got some pretty unhappy marks to this rod bearing. One of the many benefits you get with an aftermarket connecting rod, it's not only the beam strength, the, the part has to keep shape. So if the pin bore can't keep shape, then the oil doesn't flow around the pin, right? Mm -hmm. If the um, big end of the rod can't keep shape, then the oil can't flow around the pin. Like the oil is pressurized into that cavity and the rod is wider if you measure the clearance the rod is wider here than it is here yeah right so this oil kind of sits as a reservoir and then as it turns around there's this wedge they call it a hydrodynamic wedge it's this wedge of oil that keeps the parts from touching well when the component changes shape then the wedge gets disrupted it doesn't lubricate the bearing so that probably one of the reasons why i haven't seen wear like that is because i don't take apart stock engines the engines that I've been working on for a long time, they're either new builds or builds that have aftermarket components and you don't see the rod changing shape that way. But that's going back to you driving your car on the street, that wear, yeah. it's aggravated when you race it and then as you're driving it, there's a certain amount of um, plasticity of the component that it will heal you well, know, with sure. normal driving. Yeah. It'll smear that metal you know, back flat again. Yeah, it's not back to back to back. But it's stock stuff, so you can't, you can't get that it. mad at it. The guys that built this engine are watching what fools like us do to them. <laughs> they would feel all sorts of accomplished because they never saw this coming. I guarantee you they feel accomplished. Yeah, it's a thousand horsepower, you know, plus engine. My initial thought was one of the main caps you know, finally failed or something. Well, oh, so we can look at that. Um, that's what I thought. One of the signs of a cap that has been moving is that it's loose. So okay, there there's, there's and, and on these engines, it, it seems to be number five is always the first one to come loose. But see how the, this is still tight in the saddle. Yeah. This is tight in the saddle. This one's coming up. This one will come up. This one is just, just are along for the ride. <laughs> so you'll have um, the most amount of movement in that tight cap. But the tight caps, you know, they still have a a good a good spot in their saddle. They should have less um, uh, 
marks in the main saddle than the, the ones that are wiggling around. With a, when we were racing our car with a stock crank versus the um, VC crank, is okay. the bearings would show more wear from the crank flexing. And I went to the VC crank and a lot of my main bearing wear went away because the crank is staying in shape. Yeah. This is a good amount of wiping. See where they, this has wiped this bearing completely yeah. dry through here. Yep. It's dragging material. You know, it's effectively dragging material and it's starting right at the parting line. Yep. So this main is in trouble. Um, these other marks, like the stuff here, this stuff is, this one's starting to get after it. See how it's got some wiping through there, but this one, yes, this yes. is distressed. Like this, this leads to failure. Cause what'll happen is it'll pick that material up and then feed it to the rod bearings. Yeah. So, you know, you could get a, a if you, you know, if you have a, a rod bearing failure, you have to go back and look at the mains because the mains are the ones feeding the rods. The rods aren't getting oil on their own. The oil goes through the main into the, um, into the rod. And you see that, that hitting, this is from a uh, flywheel coming loose and vibrating. So the marks that we have on the front of the crank and the marks that we have on the back of the crank are, you know, based in vibration. You have the rod. What's left of it? You have the uh, pin in the top of the rod. So just broke in the beam. So the rest of this stuff is in the pan. And then you have the piston, which we can knock out. You can break a rod if you seize a pin too. So you want to look at the pin bore and see how much damage is going on and look at the pin and see how much damage is going on. If you had a lot of galling in the pin bore and the pin was hot, then the pin can seize and pull the bottom of the, out of the piston. But in this case, this stuff looks pretty good. So what you have is it just broke the rod in the middle of the beam. Yeah, and you can see it here. Look at the area of the rod that didn't get beat up against other stuff. See how it, you can see how it's, it's mechanically separated. It's pulled apart because this area is all stretched. Yeah. You know, it basically just, it's yeah. a tensile failure. But you can't be mad at it. It was grossly overused, you know? Yep. Everything has its limit. Yeah, even that, even that oil squirter got dented. You saw it. Well, the whole poor little uh, guy. The oil, the oil, <laughs> the oil galley is gone. Yeah. This is the yeah. oil galley that feeds the engine. Yeah. So that's just gone. So that that's why I said the, the, I'm glad fire. that you didn't have a fire yeah. because you have all that oil that's now being pumped out on the header. Yeah. yeah. No, a lot, of, a lot of smoke, but nothing, nothing crazy. Kind of in closing, would you have to you? being the owner of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. You're making the calls on what risks you're willing to take for the glory. You found a window that the engine lived well in, and then you went above that window, and then you went above that window even more, and you found a, a catastrophic failure. Yeah. So, you know, you're a grown man, you took known risks, you had a lot of fun at one power level, and then you got greedy, and this happened. But you didn't wreck your car, it didn't catch on fire, you know, you probably met a new friend, a lot of new friends throughout it. Like we probably wouldn't have crossed yeah. paths if you weren't out being brave. Yep. So it is what it is, you know, so it's cool. We'll get you another engine and uh, you can get back to playing. Yep.